Hi, and welcome to Counting Coral Chats. I'm Jolien Collier, and I will be your host for today's interview. Here at Counting Coral, we like to reach out and interview people from all walks of life. Some folks are about ocean conservation, and others can be marine biologists, scientists, and just your average person doing extraordinary things. Hi, and welcome to Counting Coral Chats with Sean Davey. Hey, how you doing, Sean? You all right today, mate? Yeah, pretty good. I mean, all right. Can't be that bad. <laughs> oh, well, you lucky devil. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> I'm in Arizona in the middle of the desert, so... Oh, I'm sure it has its appeals. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. So I just want to let the audience know a little bit about uh, about you. So you're born in Tassie in Australia, yeah. and uh, you started using um, a you started doing photography at a young age. And I'm going to use your words. Uh, you used a crappy old Kodak Instamatic camera, and from that moment on, you were pretty much hooked. And that was back in 1977. And since then, I mean, mate, you've got an amazing career, 25 years, you've been on 180 covers of magazines worldwide. Uh, not being yeah. funny, but that's pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, hey, can you tell us a little bit about your story? I mean, what inspired you as a kid to get in the water and start taking pictures and, you know, how did that all come about? Well, as far as the taking the pictures, I was living in Sydney, Typical surf grom, come come running, you know, come home from school every day, grab surf, would go for surf. So I came home from school one day and the waves were tiny, they were only like about six inches high, but they were really perfect. I was just sitting there going, oh man, I wish I could surf those waves. Hey, look how perfect those are. And I thought, that's a crappy old camera's been sitting in the back of the wardrobe for the last couple of years. I might go grab that, see if I can get a picture. Tell my mate, you know, take a picture and show my mates and tell them it was bigger, right? <laughs> so anyway, I went and got the camera and put it back down. Actually, I had I had the gift of of what's the word? Uh, you know, when you frame a picture, you, you automatically know where to sit to get the. You know, I, I had that. I already, I just had that. So. I got my camera all got and I got down really, really low and shot the shot the picture from almost on ground level of this little wave. And because I shot it from a low level, all my friends thought it was a lot bigger. And they're like, <laughs> oh, how come there's no one out there? And I'm like, well, it's not that big, it's only like six inches. But anyway, so that's what started that's what started me shooting pictures. Yeah, you know, from then I wanted to get into the water, but I was poor, I couldn't afford much. So I got a, I got the the the, uh, the plastic bladder out of my, one of my wine, mum's old wine casks and put my camera inside that. Used a couple of fills and taped it up and <laughs> went out and shot pictures with. I mean, within five minutes the whole thing was fogged up and useless. But you know, I was in the water shooting pictures. I mean, it, uh, the the bulb was on and you know sh shining very brightly. Well, and, you, know, you know, that's the ingeniousness of uh, an Aussie, I think. You guys are pretty, uh, you know, ingenious characters. And to, well, you know uh, what they say, necessity is the mother of invention. That's it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And this was back in the 70s. So, you know, wasn't exactly a lot of opportunities to go get an underwater housings or, you know, cameras. Pretty rough. Well, the go-to item back then was the Nikonis 3. Right. Really, really good camera. Still by today's standards. I wish they'd make a digital one. They're so good. I shot a bunch of covers on those things too. They're pretty really good cameras, but that was the, the camera to have back then if you wanted to get in the water. So when did you first decide that this was for you? For, I mean, obviously as a kid, that's passionate, it's fun, it's cool, but then, you know, you want to go into pro professional photography and, uh, you know, can you walk us through that? I mean, what was that transition like? You know, you're in well, Tasmania and... I wasn't really trying to be a professional. I was just, I was just following um, a passion, really. And, it's just kind of fell into place around me as I went. I mean, there was plenty of times where I hardly had any money in the bank and mm, I'm going to pay this month's bills and a check would always turn up in the mail. I mean, it was like that. It's just keep keep doing it and stuff will just keep flowing. And that's what I did. I just kept it flowing. I just kept shooting, you know. 
So, uh, so how old were you? And like, uh, what? Okay, here's a here's a question for you. So, you know, we 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 have all this like you know crappy gear back in the day. How old were when you started like really scaling it up and getting the nice cameras and you know the nice housings and really taking that serious? Uh, probably early mid twenties back then. Right. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, well, I, like I said, I went with the Nikonuses for for quite a while till about the late '80s when I then when I started putting SLRs in there and the waterproof housings and stuff and getting it real serious, you know. And of course, that's by that time I was getting a lot of stuff published too, especially you know in the Australian magazines. Uh, sort of breaking into the US and the Japanese magazines at the time that I moved to or started coming to Hawaii. And then it just went everywhere. I mean, surfing was everywhere. There's English magazines, Italian magazines, Brazilian magazines, New Zealand, you know, French. They're everywhere, you know. So uh, it was a good time to be a surf photographer because there's plenty of demand. Whereas you fast forward to today and there's not even one in 10 magazines left. I mean, they've just faded out because the, the millennials aren't interested in magazines. They want to see it all now. They want to see it on the phone, you know. They want it now. Yeah, there's none of this waiting two or three months for a magazine. And so consequently, I remember saying back in the day when I could see all this coming, I'm going, well, the only magazines that are going to survive are the ones that aren't, in, aren't talking about the news. They're the ones that are just publishing interesting eclectic articles, you know, that, that, that aren't time sensitive. Those are the magazines that will hang around because people will still have an interest in reading those. But anything that talks about who won the contest yesterday or who's sponsored by this company or whatever, that people don't care about that anymore, especially after a year without the, the pro surfing too, because we haven't had pro surfing for a year and things have changed a lot. People, there's, there's, there's way less emphasis on pro surfing now. There's much, much more emphasis on fun surfing. Like the surf industry, it's on its knees right now. It really is. However, people who make fun surfboards, they're killing it. They can't keep up. That's where everyone's putting their attention on is just having fun. They don't really care about the pro surfing thing so much. And I'm kind of curious to see how it goes when it comes back because it's, yeah, it's not what it was. Uh, yeah, there was a post a few weeks back, you know, the surfer magazines finally stopped producing. It's one of the oldest surf magazines on the planet and it's just done. So, you know, they're going to have to transition onto online stuff. But like you said, the surf industry is pretty much on its ass right now. Yeah, surfing and surfer used to be the two biggest magazines in the world. They were both American mags. They both ended up being bought by the same publisher who had no idea he closed them both. The two biggest, longest running surf magazines, same publisher shelved them both. So I would imagine that you had like, uh, I wouldn't say the pick of the bunch, but you know, if you're a surf photographer back in the day, there's not a few, there's not a lot of you. Like nowadays you go in the water, there's absolutely tons of people in the water all holding up a camera getting smashed. But you would, I would have imagined had way better opportunities back in those days to be able to get in the water, take those amazing shots and then hand them off to a magazine and get paid for it, right? It was so good, it was ridiculous. There'd be days out there we're swimming around talking to each other, you know, the surf photographers. And like, well, I just think I had a $10,000 day today. <laughs> Because, you know, you're like, in other words, you shot three really good waves, which you know are going to look good, and you're probably going to pull a $3,500 buyout off a surf company for, you know. You'd have days like that. You'd swim in back to the beach knowing that you had a really good day. A bit like a fisherman who comes, comes back home with three huge tuners, you know, like a little bit like that. Whereas now you could go out and shoot the most killer photos, and it doesn't matter. Nobody wants them. The companies that do want them, they've already paid some guy to, to shoot them for them. And they're probably not paying him much, but they're, they're only going to use his photos. <laughs> so he said, when I was doing it, it was such a healthy market. It was totally freelance. And it was always the best images got the, got the gigs, right? If, you, if you're shooting good stuff, okay, you're going to kill it. You know, that's, that's how it was. Whereas, it, it, you know, some stage the market got filled with, Bunch of guys who sold who sold themselves to the companies really really cheap and just totally labeled the whole industry and I that was the, uh, end of the photographers but then you know of course it all followed with the rest of the service too but 
Yeah, yeah I think was... it's moving into film a little bit as well because oh, of the drones, awesome. you know, drone that's shots. Awesome. You can just zip out with a drone, get some great images, yeah. especially at like Nazare and Pihe and places like that. You know, it's so much, uh, so much easier for those guys and they just sell that footage on to whomever at that time, you know. Yeah, and if you watch social media, video content always gets a lot, a lot more attention than, than still content. Generally speaking, sometimes there's still... I had have, I have one photo once that got 100,000 likes on Facebook. I'm like, what? <laughs> I think it must have went viral. What the hell happened there? You know? But, you know... Well, actually, to be I'll fair, Facebook, you're, really good, you're a really good photographer and you got some amazing shots, so I could understand that. I mean, you know... It's weird, though, with social media, like, how we all worked hard to build up all these platforms and then they, the companies kind of screwed it with their algorithms. I, I've got like 80,000 followers on Facebook and I barely even pay attention to it at all now. <laughs> it's just so bad. Like of those people, I'm lucky if a thousand people see my message, probably not even that. Even though oh, 80,000 yeah. said they want to see it, they don't let them see it. Yeah, so, the fascinating thing is, it's much like we were talking about earlier. So, you know, you got Facebook where you can reach hundreds of thousands of people. And yet the magazines back in the day would reach more people than they do today. And it's a push of a button that is so simple for everybody to view anything. And yet they don't choose to view it because it's not an engagement. There's no engagement. It's this mindset where it's just flick, 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 flick. And it, it's absolutely oh. nuts. <laughs> flick, 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 flick. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like if yeah. it's a really good one, I go, oh like kicker <laughs> <laughs> right that's a that's the best you can hope or maybe someone will comment you know yeah but, but i want to talk about some of your images right so i'm going to be pulling these up for the viewers and just uh, if you are tuning in and watching uh this interview at the end i'll be doing like a, a nice little um uh, slideshow of some of sean's images because they're incredible we don't have enough time to pull them all up but i wanted to pull the one up with uh the shot from Pihe uh jaws Yes, yeah, it's special. I mean, that really does demonstrate the size of these waves. Um, I'm assuming you're on the back of a jet ski when you um, shot that, right? I'm not sure which one you're talking about. I didn't put a Jaws one in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you talking about the one with the guy sitting on the jet ski? Yeah, I'm assuming yeah, no, you're on one, a jet ski and you're that's shooting. Not Jaws, that's a North Shore of Hawaii. Oh, is it? It's a, it's a misto spot that not many people pay attention to, but that day it was really huge. That's oh, mate, cool. that looks like Pihei to me, but wow, that's incredible. It's called, it's called Puena Point, just next to Haleiwa. Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So did you just get a buddy and jump on a jet ski and start shooting it because you knew a swell know. was coming in? I was actually in a boat, and I was shooting uh, the North Shore Towing Championships. I think it might have been 2006 or seven, perhaps. It just got really big in the afternoon. It was pumping. It was yeah. really good. Yeah, it is a pretty special shot, I have to say. So what's the feeling like when you're in the water with a wave that big next to you? I mean, I've been in some big waves in uh, Fiji, but nothing that big. You're always scanning the horizon and you're always getting ready to seal your camera cases shut. <laughs> in other case, in case you need to jump over, <laughs> overboard. <yeah. laughs> I've seen it happen. I was in Tahiti back in uh, maybe 2001. And there was a boat sitting kind of inside of us. It was a bit, a little bit foolhardy for him to be sitting there, but I think the photographer was trying to block the other photographers a bit. Anyway, this bigger wave came out of nowhere and caught them, caught them inside, and, the, and their boat went up the up the wave vertically. He jumped off the boat holding his case. The boat got over, and then the motion of the wave sucked it back over upside down. And the guy, the photographer who jumped off, his girlfriend was in the boat and we were worried that she died or something, but she came up. But yeah, the next day, she was in our boat. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember one day, our, the engine on our boat went, <coughs> like just, just a little bit, right? She jumped straight overboard. She didn't even feel out of it. <laughs> well, I can't blame her for that, to be fair. So well, um, if you want, later I'll send you that picture so the viewers can see it if you like. Oh, yeah, that'd be brilliant. Yeah, that'd be brilliant. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and then, so, you know, obviously, uh, you jump in the water, you've been surfing wet, uh, surfers for ages, but then you've, you've given us a few pictures of, like, you know, there's a shell on this beach and the lighting is incredible and there's this little bit of foam popping up onto the beach next to this red shell and it's absolutely spectacular shot. 
Uh, how big is lighting in your world? Uh, obviously, oh, photography is, is amazing, but lighting is everything. So I, I often get up in the dark because I'm chasing the light. And yeah, you know, a lot of the times I'm leaving the beach. I'm leaving the beach as the sun hits the beach because I've already got the shot I want. Right. But yeah, you know, but yeah, that one I called it foam comforter. In, in America, uh, you, know, you, you know, here in America, what they call the thing you put over your bed. They call it a comforter, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because we call it a doona in Australia, but I call that one foam comforter because it's getting ready to cover up the shell, you know, so it can get yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a lovely shot and like you know i mean so you're at the crack of dawn it's you know the sun's just peeking up uh, there's not a lot of surfers in the water at that time so you're not getting that light quality then if you're shooting surfers are you having to wait till the sun goes down for the same process that you know the magic Sometimes light period there's always surfers out here there's always someone surfing somewhere but usually when i'm shooting surfing i'm more often than not i'm shooting a friend of mine or, or, or someone, a surfer for somebody. Because I generally don't shoot too much surfing these days simply because I have to pay bills and it doesn't generally pay the bills these days. But yeah, I'll still shoot it from time to time. Um, yeah. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, you're not going to pay the bill shooting for uh, surfers anymore. No, it's just not going to happen. Like used to. No. Right. So, how do you pay the bills if people are interested in buying some of your art? Do you have like an online thing? Do you do canvases? What do you do? Well, I've got a, a big Epson P9000 printer here in my office, and I can print prints to as big as 44 by 120 inches. So I can cover a lot of sizes with that thing. And that's what I do. I just print fine art prints and canvases. And, um, you know, I typically I'll show something on Instagram and someone will see it and contact me. So, like, I'm, I'm old school in, in that you have to contact me to buy something off me, generally speaking. Most people, their website, they can buy straight off the website, but mine's not like that. Mine, you can look at the stuff, but you still got to contact me. But I think that's a good thing to be able to talk to the artist and really change hash out how you want it because everybody has their own idea how they want it to look and the, you know, the good thing about printing them myself is i can every time i print something it's a custom print so if they've got a, like a if they have like a very very particular measurement that they want yeah, no problem i can do that there's no skin off my back no problem at all you know? um, I'm, I'm all about quality uh, quality and service so i only use really good quality materials and service you know like it, like the old days when you people didn't charge for the extra bits, you know, like, oh, you want that service or you want a two day service? Yeah, you got to pay for that. Oh, you want this? You got to pay for that. I'm not like that. I try to give everybody a good deal and give them great service because that's what people remember, you know. I, do. I agree with you. I mean, I've built my entire business model on that. It's like, you know, you show up when you're going to say you're going to show up, you do certain things that you said you're going to do, and you'll have a customer for life, and people respond to that. And I think you're right. Connecting with the artist is really important um, oh, people love to do that they love yeah, to do that i agree with you simple conversation on the phone you know because like your to your point they could have a hallway that's not 48 inches it's 43 and a bit you know what i mean and then they need a frame this size so you can just crop it and cut it to that size and ship it off to them right i mean that's how you do yeah, well it. I, I typically ship most of my my canvases and prints like in uh, shipping tubes or like i've got one here it's in the tube already, but I've also made an extra layer around it because it's Christmas and shit gets crushed. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's, going, that's going off to Australia after I finish here. I'm going to take that down the post office. But that's a couple of large canvases that somebody just ordered, like a 72 inch and a 60 inch. I love printing up the big stuff. It's, I don't know. It's, I, I even offer discounts to people to buy the big stuff because I want them to have big pieces in their hands. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I've just pulled up an image of um, it's uh, it's like a sandy beach and there's these little foam balls popping up with a beautiful tube in the background. I mean, I'd have that on my wall all day long. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, what kind of camera settings do you need to catch like foam balls doing that? Super I mean, fast shutter speed. What is it? Shutter speed fast? Yeah, yeah really fast to capture the droplets like that. Yeah. Is it yeah, on a tripod or are you holding it? What's that? You're on a tripod or are you holding it? Uh, I'm typically, that's a pretty low angle right there. So, yeah, I'm pretty low down. Uh, so you're just going click, boom. 
Wow. Is that in an underwater housing just in case the surf comes up and smashes you? <laughs> no, no, but sometimes I do. You just kind of hold the camera up and take a beat in, right? <laughs> and some I do that with, and some I use a housing. You know, it all depends on the day and how far away it is from me. <laughs> <laughs> and how, far, how quickly I think I can react. Because, like, if I, if I can, if I'm on the land and I can, I'll always try to avoid using a housing because it's an extra layer of something yeah. between the, you know, the sensor and the... I want to get the quality as good as I can. I'm, I'm, I'm all about quality. So speaking of this image, is this like a, a shot list that you've come together to say, hey, this is what I'm going to go after today, or are you an opportunist? Say again, what was the question? I said, um, so like speaking of like an image like this, do you go out of your way to create a shot list to say, I'm going to go to the beach at this time because I know it's the best light. This is what I'm going to capture. Or you're more of an opportunist with a camera in your hand going, that's brilliant. Let me snap it's it It's a bit of both, to be honest. Sometimes I'll, yeah, sometimes I'll, Often I'll go to the, I'll go somewhere with an idea in mind and very particular idea that I want to go and capture. But often the best images they come to me because I'm there. Like a like a good example is I was at the beach one morning. I was shooting from the water. I was looking across the water at the sun coming up between the palm trees. But behind me there was a shore break going on with a rainbow above it. I'm like. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I'll just shoot that too, you know. Like, and that was the that was the star image from the session, you know, just because I happened to be there. You know, so yeah, the, some often the best shots they just come to you. You're not expecting them; you, they just come to you. Yeah, so, I see a lot of your shots that you like to um, capture kind of waves popping up with the light behind it. I mean, yeah. I've always loved being in that part of the surf. So yeah. much fun. You might take a beat in. But you get slopped around it's really cool i mean is that what's your favorite type of shooting is it that near shore stuff or is it out with the surfers forget money these forget days i love to do that stuff there's a couple of places over just down, 10 minutes down the road here that i shoot when the winds get right you, see, you need certain types of winds that aren't always happening uh but when they happen i usually head over there for sunrise because the waves they bounce off the rocks and then come back across and hit the next wave coming in. And so they create these just huge backwashes. It's really spectacular, especially with the sun right behind it. That's cool. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. Uh, I think you've produced some uh, video content that I'll throw up while we're talking so people can see you in action doing that. Oh, yeah. really fun. Yeah, that was kind of a nice day, that one. They were, they were, really, they were really happening on that morning. That's yeah, fun. and I love some of your blur imagery too. I mean, I'm pulling up a surfer. It looks like a girl on a blue surfboard. I don't know because it's blurry. I can't tell if it's a male or female. But man, it just looks like someone's painted it. Oh, yeah, that's a guy. This guy called uh, Dino Miranda. He's a really good longboarder. He's actually on a longboard. Ah, right. And that's... when you look at it, you go, that's, that's such a crazy shot for a longboard. That's yeah, actually a pipeline. I would not have thought a longboard at pipeline would have worked that well, to be fair. But I mean, well, nobody really did until these guys started going out there on them. Dino Miranda and a couple other guys, right. guys. But yeah, that was a that photo I shot that probably, I think, about an eighth of a second. Whereas, like most people will typically shoot a surf photo at something like a thousandth of a second. So, an eighth is like more than a hundred times more being captured in the same instant. If you, when you say, like, I've captured that much more time in the moment, in the time that he's moved you in that image. Yeah, no, it, like, it's it, beautiful. Like I say, it looks like a painting. Yeah, well, I'm always, I'm always about being different. And if I like, if I'm on a beach at somewhere like Pipeline, there's going to be 20 lenses at least. So I don't want to get the same picture everyone else is getting. And especially when I used to shoot surfer magazines, I always knew that the, the shot that they want was the unusual shot because they would get given the same photo by 10 different guys, right? So they're always looking for the shots that no one else has. So that's that was part of the reason I used to shoot speed blues. But then after a while, I just really dug shooting speed blue because it's, it's that's what I call them, because uh, it's a really arty way to look at it. As you say, it looks like a painting. Yeah, no, it's absolutely brilliant. And then, I, you know, I'm just looking through, when I looked through your images when you sent them over, I was just kind of going, you got that, You've got that classic kind of Malibu, Hawaii surf style with the sunset and the guy holding the surfboard. It's like 
true Americana, you know what I mean? Uh, Were you inspired by the American culture of surfing? And is that why you're shooting some of these images? It's almost like the Endless Summer type stuff, you know? Well, I'm sure the Endless Summer, Endless Summer iconic image had something to do with it, but I've always been really into hard light and silhouettes. You know, in fact, I have a collection called Shadowland, which is nothing but silhouettes and shadows and stuff. And so, yeah, I've always really kind of dug that look, no matter where I am, whether I'm at the beach or in the middle of the city or anywhere, really. It's just, it's all about the light play, the silhouettes and the light play. There's two guys that really inspired me from a young age. One was an Australian guy called Max Dupain, and he was famous in the 60s and 70s for shooting iconic images of, of uh, Australian beach life. And a lot of his images, they were black and white, and they were really hard contrast. So he was a major influence when I was young. And then another guy who influenced me along the same tangent was an American guy called Peter Turner, Pete Turner. He was a, he, I think he might have worked for National Geo at one stage, but he did the same thing, but in color. He would shoot images that were like massively colorful, like big, large blocks of color and, and blacks and stuff, like similar kind of thing, but in color. So yeah, those two guys had had an influence on my style of shooting for sure. How old were you when you were influenced by those guys? When we talking? Oh, early days, like when I was starting at photography. I mean, I, I was into photography before I started shooting it. Right. Yeah. right. In fact, I I can still remember the surf, first surf photo I ever saw was of a wave, and I was probably well under ten, but I remember seeing it. Someone had cut it out and stuck it on their wall. That's actually a wave on Kauai. <laughs> yeah. Actually, the first time I ever went to the beach was a really scary thing because I think I was about three years old and I'm a triplet. I have two older brothers as well. So anyway, mm -hmm. one was taking us all down to the beach one day and she said, you, you guys will stay on the beach here. So she went into the water and a wave came up and broke over the top of her. But to me, it looked like the wave ate her up. Like it, it looked like, oh, the ocean just opened its mouth and ate her. I'm like, what? Because the first time I'd ever seen waves, right? But it didn't, it didn't put me off the ocean. I always had an affinity for the beach and the ocean. Was, yeah, I mean, uh, that was an exciting thing as a kid, you know. You're obviously in Hawaii. Is that your playground predominantly nowadays, or yeah. you, you still travel? No, I don't travel as much as I used to because uh, I simply don't really need to. No, you don't need to these days. Uh, well, I do miss it. I miss, I miss seeing cool new places. You know, I, used to get, I used to travel a lot. When I worked with the magazines, I would always be going new places. But um, I, you know, just as be, I'd be just as happy living back in Tasmania. You know? It's beautiful down there. Yeah, I've heard nothing but beautiful things about it. I've met a lot of Tassie guys just saying, you've got to come down. The surf's amazing. Little cold. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of waves down there. It's crazy how good the place is. So you've it's got a couple of books you've been doing as well. You've got one, uh, This is the King Island. What Could you tell this us a little King. bit about the book? Yeah, that's the only one that I've got that's still available. That's cool. You can get that. If you go, if you, if you want to see it, you can Google it. Just type in, uh, just Google Sean Davey. This is King Island. It'll take you to the book at, at the, on the Blurred website. But uh, King Island's actually a, a place that I've visited 17 times since 1992. And so over the years, I've built up quite a quite a good collection of imagery from the from the all the trips. And um, every time I'd go there, people would, would say, "Why don't you put out a book? We'd really like to have a book on the island, you know." So I did. I think they ended up buying over 500 copies of it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's yeah, it's a good little book. I, I love it. It's the only one that I actually published myself. The other two books were published by other people. And that is, uh, could you tell us where King Island is? What is it actually an island called King Island? Yeah, yeah it's actually in, it's actually located in Bass Strait, which is between the mainland of Australia and Tasmania. It's on the west side of Bass Strait, halfway between Tasmania and Melbourne. Yep, and. It's basically, uh, it's it's basically a huge farming community. That's what it is. It's all just farms and country folk. It's nice. Mm. The beaches there are just beautiful, and the waves are great. And 
Yeah, it's just a really nice place. I mean, I could live there. I could retire there. Man. It would be nice. In fact, uh, since you know, since I've been there last, uh, they've built two golf courses on the island, which are supposed. Both of them are supposed to be in the top ten golf courses in the world. So you're thinking of retiring there and playing golf, <laughs> hanging up the hat. I just remember, I remember because yeah, the King Island's world famous for its beef, as some of the best beef in the world. Mm. And the company got bought by, I think it might have been a Chinese operation, bought them out, or was Korean. And so and they were worried about uh, losing the, the King Island brand. And I said, well, you guys have got such a beautiful island here. What, you, you, you're only a half hour flight from Melbourne, <laughs> one of the biggest cities in Australia. You guys should be like doing stuff to attract people to the island. And so someone obviously took that to heart and built the golf courses. And that's what started it. You know, now they're doing little junkets down there where they fly people down there on planes and you know, feed, have these big long table festivals and stuff. So yeah, they're starting to do that where they're trying to attract the people from Melbourne to come over and check them out. It's a beautiful place. I love it. Yeah, it's amazing. You've got these little gems that are just sat there and people don't even know that they exist. And yet there's so much going on there. And from a photo photographic standpoint, I would imagine it's one of those true jewels and treasures that you, you know, really enjoy to go and take photographs of, you know. Of course, though, there's always that human nature element where something finally gets discovered and you can kiss a goodbye. <laughs> true. Now, remember that lyric out of the Eagles song, The Last Resort? Call yep. some place paradise and kiss it goodbye. Yeah. Well, listen, Sean, I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, uh, so if people wanted to buy a print, is it seandavy.com uh, or is there another URL? Well, seandavy.com is my website. But um, if they want to contact me, just get them to email info, like information. Info at seandavy.com will get me. That's All the right. best way to get me is via email. All right, brilliant. So if anyone's watching, there you go, info at Sean Daly, and I'll post those links. No, in no, no, you, ah, you screwed up. You said daily. It's daily. Oh, sorry. I'll <laughs> let it out. For all you guys that are viewing, you can get hold of uh, Sean Davy at info at Sean Davy. Um, but okay. listen, uh, thanks again, and I really appreciate you taking the time, Sean. And for anybody who's watching, stay tuned for the um, the little screenshots of all the images that he's provided for us. They're beautiful. It's worth taking a little look. Thanks a lot, Sean. I appreciate it. All right. Cheers. <laughs>